So I work with environmental humanities and feminist environmental uh, perspectives and in my project um, that I'm working on as part of my postdoc at the University of Turku, um, I'm interested um, in why certain ecologies um, are considered worth uh, protecting and preserving while others are not and how environmental politics intersect with multiple axes of power operating along the lines of gender, class, ethnicity, nationhood and species. I look into these questions through a lens of the relationships and interdependencies between humans and forests, and particularly I've focused on the primeval Białowieża forest, which is quite a, a unique ecological uh, location um, and has a great European nature conservation value, including it has a UNESCO natural world heritage uh, status and Natura 2000 status. But about the excuses. So um, my today's talk uh, will stray a little bit from the original focus that I outlined um, and advertised in the abstract, uh, which was uh, temporality. Uh, and today, instead, I would like to focus uh, rather on movement and particularly on walking as an embodied way of knowing the forest. And this is very much work in progress, so I'm also uh, both nervous and excited, excited to be presenting this work because, uh, because I'm, I'm currently working on that. So I'll be looking forward to your feedback, um, but also this is not something super massaged at this point. Okay. Um, also Zoom, right? I mean, why is everything online? Um, okay. Cool. Okay. Um, the Białowieża forest is the last uh, well-preserved fragment of once vast lowland temperate forests in Europe. With its old growth forest stands, the forest comprises a highly resilient system in which numerous ecological processes and phenomena that have otherwise vanished from the European continent can still be observed. When I first got interested in the Białowieża forest, it was right after, or actually it was during the massive protests against its logging back in 2017. What came to fascinate me was that the forest seemed to be an imploded object it seemed to be waftling at the edges of time, somewhere at the peripheries of history and the peripheries of Europe. I saw its temporality as ambiguous and shape-shifting. It seemed to be placed in a tension between its relic-like status, resembling a museum, a skansen, a window to the past, and its adhesiveness to different ideas about future as it entered discussions about survival, preservation, resilience, climate change, and the many visions of the ecological to come. It shimmered at me, rich with meanings, histories, and networks of living things, and it attracted me as if I were a magpie. The forests were first. Oops. The forests were first, Robert Polk, um, Harrison emphasizes in his famous book, Forests, the Shadow of Civilization, um, in which to the governing institutions of, of the West, Harrison, um, Harrison sort of argues that forests are the double. Philosophers like Jean Battista Vico in his uh, The New Science outlined a progressive narrative about human civilization. In the beginning, there were forests, then emerged huts, followed by villages that grew into cities, and finally, the academies were erected. And then they all collapse and go back to the forests. This enduring trope is still present in, for example, 
um, Alan Wiseman's uh, was once best-selling uh, The World Without Us. In this book, he envisages the world after the ecological catastrophe and the disappearance of the human, when forests once again take over. The forest of Białowieża, tucked in a remote corner of Eastern Europe, serves him as a model to prefigure this post-human and post-apocalyptic future of the earth when nature is reborn and slowly erases the signs of human presence. For a Dutch art duo, Persing Brorsen and Margaret Lukacs, the Białowieża forest is a green screen of sorts to ponder about the nature of digitality and nature of image. In the video installation, Forest on Location from 2018, the original space of the forest melts into a pixeled reality. A forest is an imploded object. It's natural cultural, collapsing and mushing up these categories. It is, it is a botanic fabric and a complex ecological system an object regulated by legal, historical, imagined, and pragmatic rub rubrics that chart the relationships between people and the natural environment. As culturally inscribed, forests are weaved into the unfolding history of ownership structures, dominant modes of production, and transformations in power and knowledge systems. They grow amid global world-making processes, be them economic, historical, epistemological, scientific, or literary. Um, <clears throat> Polish um, anthropologist Agata Kontral, uh, in her brilliant monograph about Polish forestry, distilled six meanings of Polish uh, forests. Forest is history and post-socialist present. It is valued as a natural space, as a uh, resource, and as a subject of expert knowledge. And finally, a meaning that Conjol herself values most and theoretically develops and elaborates on in her work is a forest as a multi-species landscape. Uh, excuse me a second. Um, it wasn't until recently that I started thinking about walking as a method to expand on the available understandings of the forest. But once I experienced a need, perhaps a compulsion even, to walk, to walk and think, I wanted to see how walking adds extra layers of felt, embodied and situated meaning. It is about movement, direction, orientation, pace and tempo, and about attentiveness. The experience of gendered walking was something that came up repeatedly in my conversations with people in the Pushta. Um, many of the Pushta, by the way, means uh, forest primeval in, in Polish, and I use that uh, word uh, quite a lot to refer to the Białowieża uh, Pushta. <clears throat> many of these encounters took a form of walking along conversations. How could I leave out this mobile, stepped aspect that became so crucial for this project? Whereas Rebecca Solnit, Solnit had it, uh, walking is never quite about walking, and forests, I would add, are often not quite about forests, but about thinking too. Eduardo Cohn um, in this vein asks, so how should we think with forests? How should we allow the thoughts um, in and of the non-human world to liberate our thinking? Posting the status of the last primeval forest in Europe, the Białowieża forest uh, is a well-walked place. Hikers, tourists, wanderers, naturalists, scientists, mushroom pickers and bird watchers all flock here for astounding nature, ecological abundance, fresh air, and recreation. There are the old paths of the royal hunts back in the day, the ways of sylvan beekeepers and potash makers, 
and those of today's foresters, scientists and tourists. There are curated walks in the strict reserve led, led by certified guides, walks on wooden trails just above the ground. There are special tours designed for people with visual impurities, which engage other senses, smell, touch, a sense of one's own body as an object in space, otherwise known as proprio perception. There are healing walks according to the Japanese art of shirin yoko or forest bathing, and there are women's circles. There is all this movement in the forest, by which I do not mean human movement only. Daily rhythm of animal and plant motions, birds chirping at early hours, the bison showing up at the edges of the forest, beavers chewing on tree trunks, and the nocturnal rhythm settled by owls, bats, wolves, and minks. A forest in its incessant process of birthing and dying and its uniqueness. And its uniqueness lies in, its two, in the two being inseparable. When a tree dies, the dead wood feeds the lichen, fungi, moss, and insects all the living forms that over time convert it into something else. Living trees too are in constant movement, pulsating, growing, swelling, and shrinking. Walking in a forest can be an activity which, following Rebecca Solnit's reflections on walking, reveals the deeply rooted connections between various forms of life, a calming movement which aligns the thoughts, the body and the world, connecting the feet and the earth. But the history of walking is also um, the history of thinking. Kant, Rousseau, Nietzsche, Thoreau and, uh, and de Beauvoir were not only famous philosophers, but also avid walkers. For Heidegger, inspired by Schwarzwald, the black forest outside of Freiburg, walking the forest path becomes analog to thinking. The forest becomes the world and forest clearings are sites through which shines the very being. And yet walking in nature remains an activity shaped by the very same power structures that underlie nearly any other space be it a workplace, a city, an airport, school, hospital, or prison. Stephanie Springday admits that walking is also about the complicated histories of who is granted permission to enter nature, where nature is set to reside, how one must move in order to get there, and how one will interact with nature once one arrives in it. Disability studies scholar Alison Kafer, when discussing how what she calls social arrangements have been mapped onto natural environments, argues that, quote, whether we focus on nature writing or trail construction, disabled people are figured as out of place, end of quote. Similarly, indigenous and black nature writers explain, in the words of Alaskan environmental writer May May Evans, that culturally dominant conceptions of what constitutes nature becomes more clear when we encounter the narratives of those who are not expected or allowed to go there." Um, end of quote. For example, the easiest way to get to the Białowieża forest is to drive there. But owning a car, as well as a possibility to pay for your weekend getaway in the forest spa, are matters of class, as much as they are a matter, a matter of access. And now I would like to talk a little bit uh, about um, gendered walking, sort of the background uh, to start talking about it. And that's what the, this talk is going to uh, focus on. So in the wake of the Me Too movement that started in October 2017 on social media, after a call to women who have been sexually assault, uh, assault, assaulted or harassed to set Me Too as their social media status, stories of major and everyday transgressions inundated the internet. 
the question of freedom to move, access to public space and safety emerged in a new light in mainstream discussions. What does walking mean to those who embody some form of femininity? Sylvia Plath, aged 19, in her personal journal wrote, Yes, God, I want to talk to everybody, uh, everybody I can, as deeply as I can. I want to be able to sleep in an open field, to travel west, to walk freely at night. Rebecca Solnit shares that the most devastating discovery of her life was, and I quote, um, <clears throat> that I had no real right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness out of doors, that the world was full of strangers who seemed to hate me and, and wished to harm me for no reason other than my gender, that sex so readily become violence and that hardly anyone else considered it a public issue rather than a private problem. <clears throat> so Solnit argues that historically women who walk were treated as sexually available to men. They were associated with street walkers, public women, street workers. She writes, Women have routinely been punished and intimidated for attempting, attempting the most simple of freedoms, taking walk, because the walking and indeed the very beings have been construed as uh, inevitable, continually sexual in those societies concerned with controlling women's sexuality. Sylvia Federici traces back how the criminalization of prostitutes and vagabonds coincides with the growing control over human bodies in times of enclosures and emerging billism. She argues that in the process of transition to a capitalist economy, all women started to be treated as the so-called common women. She argues that, and this is a quote from Caliban and the Witch, for in pre-capitalist Europe, women's subordination to men had been tempered by the fact that they had access to the commons and other communal assets. While in the new capitalist regime, women themselves become the commons, as the work was defined as a natural resource laying outside the sphere of market relations. End of quote. Staring, catcalling, and groping are not uncommon present day spillovers of the age long control and threat of violence against walkers whose bodies are located on the spectrum of femininity. Virginie de Pont, in her autobiographic manifesto, The King Kong Theory, describes her walking years first as a young and rebellious punk girl who would hitchhike penniless to get to see music shows, and later as a sex worker. While sex work allows the pawn to regain control over her body after a sexual assault she experienced, the experience of rape is positioned by her as an always present risk, inextricable from the very possibility to walk, to be outside of the house. So I carried on traveling to cities where I didn't know a soul, she writes, waiting alone in train stations until, until they closed, so I could spend the night there, or sleeping in between nearby buildings, waiting for the first morning train, acting as if I wasn't a girl. And although I wasn't raped again, I risked it a hundred times just by being out of, uh, just, just by being outdoors a lot, she writes. In that sense, walking, either in nature or in, in a city, as a body associated with femininity or decoded as feminine, always puts it at a risk of violence or attack, or at the very least, discomfort. 
in a patriarchal system, the very fact of being uh, out, walking, being out of doors, displaces some of the responsibility for the possible assault, assault on the walker herself. In contrast, the power of feminist walking, uh, walking together, resisting the long history of criminalizing and restricting walking of women, queers, and vagabonds. Marching, protesting, even famous women walking tours or walking each other home at night, um, taking to the streets, walking with, along, and together are embodied practices of reclaiming space for our bodies. When in mid-2020, amidst vicious anti-LGBTQ attacks incited by the conservative Polish government, Polish queer activist Margot Szutowicz was arrested for participating in a protest and vandalizing a police car, supporters flocked to the streets with handmade, you will never have to walk alone posters. If walking alone could amount to a feminist statement, walking together, is a feminist political practice of solidarity and resistance. Against this rich, multi-layered background, in what follows, I interrogate gendered practices of walking in the Białowieża forest and try to unpack what other meanings they may add to our cultural understandings of forests. <clears throat> Okay, so the first part is called um, Running Free. <clears throat> In her 1980 essay, Throwing Like a Girl, Iris Marion Young analyzes from a phenomenological perspective how bodily movements of women are restricted by and in a patriarchal society. <clears throat> she writes, not only is there a typical way of throwing like a girl, um, but there is a more or less typical style of running like a girl, climbing like a girl, swinging like a girl, hitting like a girl. End of quote. I meet with Zofka in a village of Teremiski. We are sitting in a wild garden just outside of an old wooden building that once was a school now the headquarters of Obus La Puszcze, or the Camp for the Forest. A group of environmental activists that confronted foresters and successfully blocked logging of the forest three years prior. We meet to talk about Vypuszczone, a feminist collective which organizes female empowerment, empowerment retreats in the Białowieża Puszcza, of which Zofka is a part. Vypuszczone is a play on words, untranslatable into English. Verb vypuszczać means to let go, to set free, to release. In its reflexive form, vypuszczać się, um, it means to set out on an adventure. But the name is also a portmanteau, which holds within itself another word, puszcza, which in many Slavic languages, including Polish, means the old growth forest or a forest primeval. Uh, the Vypuszczone Collective opens up the outdoors to girls, women, and other non-male identified people in an effort to teach, empower, and build bonds between them. The first retreat took place in 2018, when Zofka joined forces with a group of women she had met at Obus La Puszcze. Together, they organized retreats for teen and pre-teen girls, then followed by another one aimed for adult women, femmes, and genderqueer folks. And then they had quite ambitious plans uh, for other retreats that were stopped with, um, you know, this year with the pandemic and couldn't be organized. Um, Zofka used to live in the Knoszynska forest. Um, where her husband taught biology to urban high school students during educational field trips. It was during these trips, Zofka is now telling me, that, I quote, I noticed that girls in these groups tended to stay away when it came to outdoor activities. They focused on what inconvenienced them. 
sleeping outdoors frightened them. They complained that there was no running water to wash their hair. Chopping wood was one of those activities that girls would stay away from. Solely boys seemed to enjoy it, and if girls got down to it, then only under the ironic gazes. Young wrote over 40 years earlier that, quote, many of the observed differences between men and women in the performance of tasks requiring coordinated strength are not due so much to brute muscular uh, strength, but to the way each sex uses the body in approaching tasks. Women often do not perceive themselves as capable of lifting and carrying heavy, heavy things, pushing and shoving with significant force, pulling, squeezing, grasping, or twisting with force. Mm, that's the end of uh, that quote. The girls, they look, but they are not invited to enter the world, Zofka told me. I grew up thinking that being a girl sucked, she admits with a disarming honesty. Don't get me wrong, she, she goes on. I don't think that the biggest problem with the patriar patriarchal system is that girls don't chop wood. But when we let them do it outside of heavily gendered cultural constraints, they may like it. For Zofka, a forest becomes a space where the masculine gaze is lifted. The boy's ironic stares are gone. The mirror is gone. It is a space to explore, experiment, and discover, to run wild. It's about being outdoors in the world, hiking, tree climbing, running free. As the pond would have it, we had gone out into the wild because nothing much ever happened in mommy's and daddy's house. Zofka encounters with other people who understand themselves in, a, in, in multiple ways in the relation to the femininity is part of a process that she calls bec becoming buddies with one's own femininity. It is a spectrum of possible ways of being in the world, experiencing it and living your body, of which being a girl, being girly, or being perceived as a girl is just one element. The forest becomes a fold in the normative social and cultural landscape, allowing to experiment with gendered expressions and possible ways of engaging with the world around us. Okay, so part two of three, beware of wolf. Zopka tells me how walking off the beaten track solo in the forest can be both liberating and exhilarating. Agata, a weather expert in the Forest Research Institute in Białowieża, is telling me about the joy she feels when being in the forest. The real thing is when you go off the trail. You feel branches swapping you, slapping your face and nettles stinging your feet. I often was treated, that's Agatha, Agatha from, the, from our interview. I often was treated as the old one out. People were, were surprised that I would wander in the forest alone or they would warn me that I would end up eaten, eaten by a wolf. The threat of being eaten as a risk, a consequence or a punishment for leaving the house for being out in the wild seems to be a recur recurring motive in many of my conversations with women who live or work in the forest. Agatha's job is to monitor the dynamics of change in the pushta. She collects biosensing data from electronic uh, dendrometers, highly precise instruments, kind of like bands wrapped around the tree trunk which continuously measure changes in plant diameter and document the response of plants to the environment. It allows her to see the incessant movement of the forest, its recompositions and metamorphoses. Climate change is one of these factors that impact, uh, impact these vibrant recompositions of materiality. 
we have to say goodbye to some species, like spruce, and welcome others, like common hornbeam, a des deciduous broadleaf tree with vertical markings and sometimes a short twisted trunk which comes to dominate the forest today. But welcoming them is not always an easy task. From the perspective of the forest industry, hornbeams are essentially a weed. Agatha explains that hornbeam is considered of low value by foresters because it doesn't bring profit. It's hard for this species to grow straight. It doesn't have slender trunks like a spruce or a pine tree. Hornbeams are really laid back, she loves. They grow in every, every each direction, however suits them, creating beautiful shapes from the twisted trunks. They are incredibly resilient, she adds. Agatha is also a nature tour guide in the strict reserve of the Białowieża forest. And she's now telling me about her favorite tree there. There is this one tree I always pointed out to tourists. For me, it's a symbol of hope. Uh, if this hornbeam tree is still alive, then you should never give up. It's experienced all imaginable misfortunes. It's halved, bent towards the ground, crushed by other trees, and it's basically empty inside but it still sends up new shoots. This resonates with Stacey Alamo's call for post-human resilience. In a very short essay she did for this um, feminist journal Resilience, uh, she writes, resilience when considered from a more than human perspective, sorry, reminds us of the worldly agencies energies and transformations that can generate unexpected vital beings, life forms and relations. Thinking about the abundance and the agency of a forest, I pay special attention to the moments when human processes of knowledge production about the forest are interrupted. Agatha tells me about the woodpecker that comes back repeatedly to beak on one of the dendrometers that she's installed and she's responsible for. It works on the instrument until it's smashed completely. Agatha advocates something that I interpret, uh, interpret as ethics of non-intervening. For her, the forest is where the non-human stories animate the place and our human role is to let them. Humans occupy a smaller, humbler position vis-a-vis -vis those processes that weave this intricate web of life of which we are but a tiny part. In a forest, she tells me, things change all the time. Each day is different from the, pre from the previous one. Something with us, something else blossoms in instead. One thing dies, another, another one takes up its place. The play of light, the movement, and it never stops. In this forest, the main role is not to interfere um, with these pro in these processes. And I think it's difficult for people because we are often used to, th used to the idea that to care is to act. But to care is also to step back and let, let things be just to be and observe and be attentive. Um, and the third part, third meaning uh, of the forest is forest is a lesson in healing. The forest offers a lesson in resilience and in saying goodbye. Anya is a young forestry student and an amateur folk, folk musician she works for the Białowieża National Park, where she is responsible for monitoring rare and endangered insects. She explains to me, um, she explains to me that, quote, we need to be prepared to say farewell to coniferous forests. Spruce is a, bure a boreal uh, species and it's vulnerable to climate change. It was planted because it grows quickly and is profitable 
but it is vanishing now, like the beach did before it. Something else will replace it. Now it's the Hornbeam. Norway maples are doing well. The push keep, keeps changing. People find it so hard to make peace with transience, but in a forest, seedlings can sprout even from a trunk of a fallen tree. Her words remind me of, uh, um, of, the way, of a similar way in which anthropologist Anna Singh writes um, when she says that to walk attentively through a forest, even a damaged one, is to be caught by the abundance of life, ancient and new, underfoot and reaching into the light. For her, like for Anya, the forest is a changing web of life, a mosaic of vibrant matter, of which humans are just a small part. I remember visiting Vilja Triba, that's the fragment of uh, the Białowieża forest, you can see the picture here, uh, not long after the 2017 logging, and then a couple of years uh, after. The wounded forest, disfigured at times, injured by harvesters, quickly became overgrown with weeds, small trees, seedlings shooting up in the middle of a disturbed landscape. I saw signs of resilience and signs of resistance. Some trees were cut up really high, leaving huge stumps like, amputate, like amputated limbs. The harvesters couldn't manage cutting them closer to the ground. Too thick and massive, these trees stood. A woman who lives uh, next door to a car mechanic in a village of Teremiski, not far from Vilchatryba, told me that during the 2017 logging, the harvesters were constantly serviced. These machines are designed to log tree plantations, not old growth forests. The tough terrain, variety of tree species, thick undergrowth put up resistance to the machines. Kate Sandilands offers the idea of queer ecology as an ethical proposition to both see beauty in the wounds of the world and take responsibility to care for the world as is. In her essay, she writes about the possibility of healing through nature that is not always pure or pristine. I recount this idea to Dr. Katarzyna Simonienko, a psychiatrist and a certified forest therapist who organizes therapeutic workshops in the Białowieża forest. She tells me matter-of-factly that she wouldn't take her clients into an environmentally destroyed landscape wary of the emotional reactions it may trigger in them and whether these um, reactions, these potential reactions could be contained and processed in a safe way. But about the healing aspect of walking in the forest, she says, the more we know about ecological processes around us, the more analogies are born for us, giving us a chance to understand how similar we are to the world around us. One phenomenon that is very useful for such comparisons is mycorrhiza, a network of symbiotic connections between trees and fungi, which allows for an exchange of energy, information and matter between these organisms. Nothing in the forest is alienated, even the stuff that is ugly is necessary. And that helps. Um, and this is where I would like to leave it for now um, and hopefully open the discussion. Thank you so much.